Yeah, I remember Tom Mestro said that, you know, once he got to know Michael and he was working on his case, Michael said that his biggest regret was settling that first lawsuit. Michael Jackson told me in no uncertain terms that settling that case in 1994 was the biggest mistake he'd ever made. He should never have settled it. He should have fought it through a trial. He would have won. It was an absurd case. But he was advised, he told me, by lawyers, by business advisors, to settle it and get rid of it. Remember that one boy? Now listen to this. I have to tell you this. Okay. So after I left the party, and the next day I smoked weed with Michael, and then I get I get in the limousine and I leave. I get back to the Sheraton Hotel at Universal over here. There's four FBI agents waiting for me in the hotel room. And my mom's there and she's like, tell them what happened. And I'm like, what do you mean tell them what happened? And I sit down with them and they all get asked these super sexually exploiting, you know, questions, mm-hmm. back backsided questions. And I knew that at my age already. And I looked at all four of them and I said, I said, are y'all crazy? I said, what you think I'm going to do? Tell you that Michael did something bad so that we, we can sue him for money? That's what I told him. I was like, you're crazy. And I looked over at my mom and I was like, are you serious, mom? I was like, what is going on here? Why are you letting this happen? And she goes, she goes, well, she goes, oh, well, I think something happened. You know, I think something. I'm like, really? That man did nothing but be hospitable kind, loving, giving, everything you can think of. We rode four wheelers for five hours, me, him, and Chris Tucker in the mountains at nighttime after his birthday party. Him and I hung out and talked pretty much all night. Got a couple hours of sleep. I wake up. He's not even in the room. He pulled out a cop for me in his room because I asked him, I was like, I want to hang out with you. You know, I want to be around. You know, it was Michael. Yeah. You know, I want to hang out with Michael. I want to hang out with Michael. He pulled out a, a little cot or something. I laid on the cot. I wake up in the morning. His bed's made. There's a queenie lady that wakes me up. I keep asking, where's Michael? I go over. He's got this this huge statue figurine that Michael Jordan sent him for his birthday because he collected that stuff. Went and smoked some weed with him. Get in the car. And then all this shit happened when I got back to LA. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? I was like, and I looked at my mom. I go, are you really trying to go at Michael and use me for a money grab? I was like, nothing. And I looked at him right now. I said, nothing happened. Mm. I said, Michael was flirting with girls right in front of me. Actually. Yeah. And it was hilarious because he was very charming. <laughs> I bet. It's Michael Jackson. <laughs> he, made, he made girls just light up, blush. And he was, he, 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 and like, I saw him looking at girls' booty. I said, I, I saw you looking at her booty. He was like, mm hmm. I was like, <laughs> and so I hear these stories of like Wade Robson. And then I'm like thinking to myself, wait, hold up. I know Wade Robson. Wade Robson pretended to be the voice on my my album, Aaron's Party, for my brother. Because my brother didn't do it. So Wade Robson did it. It was like a little spoof thing, an in interlude in, one, in my second album, Aaron's Party. And Wade Robson did the voice of like pretending to be my brother or some yeah. shit. And I'm like, wait, hold up. Wade leaving Neverland? What is this? Like, what do you mean leaving Neverland? Like, I left Neverland. Everything was cool, homie. <laughs> like, what's your problem? Did you dream this up? Did your parents tell you to do this? Yeah, I mean, they tried to sue for like $100 million and ultimately it was dropped. They got nothing out of it, the, as they should. If nothing, uh, as they that should. dude didn't do shit like that. Yeah. Like, I knew Michael better than all of them. Yeah, I, I believe even, it. Everything even Macaulay, that I've seen, if it was Macaulay yeah, I, right not, now. I'm not buying it. Even I, if not, it was Macaulay Culkin sitting right here, he would tell you the same thing I did with the same assertiveness. Yeah, no, I, I remember, you know, when I spoke to, to Tom about this, we actually pulled up some of the files of when they raided uh, Neverland and there was like a, a list of all the things that they, you know, was part of evidence. And they actually found his porn collection, right? right? right. And I'm looking through the porn and it's got the titles of everything. And I'm like, and I remember at one point I went through the paperwork um, from the the, the sheriff's uh, office of all the stuff that they found in Neverland Ranch. And it was actually a large pornography collection of like straight porn. Like 
<laughs> you know, kind of stuff I would watch. Uh, and at that point I said, okay, that's all nonsense. Michael Jackson seemed like he was a straight man. Well, when they raided Neverland, and again, it was 70 plus sheriffs raided Neverland, they found hordes of Playboy, Penthouse, and what I call girly magazines. Right. And they didn't know how to explain this because they knew this could help the defense right. in explaining he's not a pedophile. He's not someone who's enraptured with young males. Mm -hmm. He's a heterosexual male who likes to look at beautiful women who are naked. Well, this is the type of stuff I watch. Like this, this, this is this is this is not gay at all. Like you know, what I mean, you wouldn't have a porn collection and that the, big and, 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 and as guy, a gay guy, man of all straight right, porn. Like, right, right, that makes and, no sense. And the guy couldn't really have relationships too. Remember, what I was telling you how hard it is. Oh yeah. But what we do, like, to find like a normal relationship, it's hard as hell. You got to date people of the same caliber as you that have as much to lose. And, and he well, you're Michael he, Jackson. There's he, no he, one he, at he the did caliber. He did Lisa Marie Presley, yeah. but he couldn't even do that. And then he had to find a surrogate. Yeah. You know. That's sad, man. This life can be sad if you let it. Yeah. It could be really lonely and really sad if you let it. You know, also, he had the kids, you know, and yes, that changes you, but I don't think it fully changed him, you know? Hmm. I don't think it really, because it, it, it was hard for him to, I think, not to have had the actual emotional connection to make that child, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, nothing, and, nothing against people who get surrogates because that's right. such a blessing. Well, I mean, he got that's a surrogate, a but I don't think those children are biologically his. I don't think that was his sperm that that was used in that surrogate. I, uh, those children I, do not I, look I, like I, him I in, mean, in the least. No, no in the offense, least bit. I know Paris and all that, but I, I actually, I kind of agree. You know, I mean, it just is what my it is. My buddy B. Howard looks more like his son than anyone else. Well, if you just look at all of his siblings, I mean, you know, and B. all Howard the children. Is? No, I don't. B. Howard, look B. him up. B. Howard? Yeah. Look up B. Howard, Michael Jackson, and tell me that's not Michael's real son. Oh, yeah. That was like Michael Jackson. Okay. Right. He's yeah. a singer, too. Yeah. He looks a lot like Michael Listen Jackson. Listen to him sing mm. a Michael Jackson song. So you're saying that's his real son? That's his. That's my friend. That's his real son. Okay. And the world doesn't even really know it. Okay. Listen to him sing. This is you saying it, not me. I'm not. I'm, not I'm gonna, saying it right now. You know, this is the first time hearing about this. Well, yeah. I mean, I just want to say, and listen, at the end of the day, you know, kids are kids. Like, it doesn't matter biologically, not biologically. You know, clearly he raised them. You know, they're, they're, they're great kids. You know, he had an emotional connection to them. But the reality is, is that none of those kids look like him. And when you look at his, you know, Michael's siblings, who many of which had mixed kids. I agree. They look like. The, the fathers and the mothers <laughs> like no, they agree. don't they I don't agree. look I, none I, of them I, look I, like I, michael jackson's I kids i can't disagree with you i yeah, see it just it is what I, it is i yeah. feel there's a certain level of like cognitive dissonance yeah with michael jackson fans where they're like no those are his kids we, we, we you know we're, we refuse to believe that this man lied about anything in life and it's just like 100 percent yeah 100 percent but yeah the michael jackson Army is pretty serious. It's turned against me a few times. It's been it's, yeah, you know it's been they're amusing. they're serious. They're not, they're not as strong as they used to be, but at least they know that I got his back. You know yeah, and I don't have his back for them. I have the, his back for him. There you go. And because I know him. <laughs> well, you know, you look at boy bands now, and clearly the biggest boy band in the world is BTS. Is it right now? Yeah. BTS. Well, I know they won four awards at the AMAs, right? Yeah, I mean they have that big song with Coldplay. Well, that song sucked. Butter. Uh, no. Smooth like butter. Universe. No, there's one called Smooth like butter too. That's I don't know about, but Universe is the song that, that I. That song sh shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, number one, are you well, surprised? Am I get the BTS trolls now? <laughs> Maybe. Well, I mean, look, I got nothing against them. You know what I mean? I I I hope they're really singing the records. Hmm. All right, one. First of all, there's, there's no uh, Millie Vanilli here. Uh, you don't think there's a Millie Vanilli? There, I, might there be better Millie not be because I'll, I'll, I'll be pissed off. and I will because also I, I find it ironic that there's seven of them or 10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, good good luck with the splits, guys. <laughs> right. Uh, how y'all going to all get along? Like, damn. Um, I, I, I honestly there's, there, like, there's seven. There's seven members. Yeah, seven. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I do not care to listen to any of their music. 
Um, it's not my style. It's not what I listen to. You know what I mean? It's nothing against well, the right. I mean, we're fan too, base we're, or we're BTS. Old, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we're too old and we're also male. I mean, these these guys are geared towards a you know a pre a teen female audience. No, so, but as you know, the Z generation is now like twenty five when they're like fifteen. They they they. They have no, I, I they guess. have no filters. <laughs> I guess, but no, no. it's the truth. <laughs> okay, these no, little kids enough. that are 13, 14, 15, 16, you don't see them rapping at this age now, too. Well, that's true. It's fl- flossing guns and shit. Right. Like what the hell? I mean, being, I mean, you weren't in a boy band, but you were part of the the overall genre in terms of like like the you know the audience and so forth. Mm-hmm. When when you look at someone like a BTS, mm-hmm. what do you think? is the greatest you know obstacle that they will have to deal with you know longevity mm. longevity That's the problem. yeah with seven members longevity uh also i mean there's a, there's a fan choice type of thing i get it but i feel like we're losing so much talent you know i grew up in the 90s man with Brian Adams and, you know, just, just, you know, Journey, Steve Perry and just vocalists that were just out of this world, you know, Steven Tyler. I see what's happening with music now and I'm just like, there's, you know, the only greats that we really have right now is Bruno Mars. Okay. Best male uh, singer. I, I can see that. Best male singer in the world. No, it's a fact. Wait, best male singer in the world? Ever. Yeah, in the world. Like he Bruno is Mars. Bruno Mars. Over Sam Over Smith? Chris Brown? By far. Really? His tone, the register he can hit. Of huh. course. Absolutely. Bruno Mars over Chris Brown. Hmm. Yeah. Chris Brown, probably about a Chris four. Chris Brown's no <laughs> slouch, man. Well, neither am I. And I'm up there too. I can I'm about a four, four and a half octave range. So okay. on my love album, you can clearly hear that. So I can hit higher notes than Smith, Sam Smith. So um, you know. I would put like, I don't, I mean, Bruno Mars, vocalist, definitely Chris Brown, amazing. Me, I'm amazing, definitely. I've studied my craft and I know what I'm doing. I've done classical. I've, I've been trained in many different ways with vocalization. I, even my vocal coach was Michael Jackson's vocal coach, Seth Riggs. Mm. So I don't know if Chris Brown worked with Seth Riggs. He might have. Uh, Bruno Mars smokes two packs of Cowboy Killers a day, and he's got one of the Cowboy highest. Cowboy ra- Killers. He's got one of the high. <laughs> that's about Southern in me. He 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 got that. He's got one of the best ranges of any male. He has the best range of any male hmm. in the industry right now. I mean, there's also Usher. Nope. nope. Usher can't hit the nose. Bruno can. Trust hmm. me. I know. Um. I mean, I mean, you mentioned longevity. L- 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 Justin Timberlake managed to come out of the the boy band era and have a really successful solo career and continues to be successful, I feel. He's the one that Yeah, yeah. He broke the mold to a certain degree. He he broke the mold for to a certain degree. Yes, I I think that um and I think what you mean by that is that he pulled himself away from the nostalgic yeah, uh era. Yep. And a lot of these boy bands, you know, the O teens or whatever O O towns or whatever O town yeah <laughs> O teens <laughs> uh, the you know the oval teens um, <laughs> uh, they're stuck in the past ninety eight degrees I see these guys you know they tour and they do the pop two thousand tour I was on that tour and I quit yeah yeah I quit I was like I'm not doing this nostalgic shit no more I'm not doing it no thank you told my agents everybody. You know, I'm sure they're all pissed off at me, but whatever. If, you, if they don't want to book me shows, don't worry about it. I can book my own damn shows. I manage myself. You know, I have a great team around me. And if I want to book a tour and have 100 dates, I can do it with the stop of my fingers with my Rolodex. So I don't even need an agent. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think the greatest singers right now. I mean, although he's a little busy these days, uh, you can't forget about R. Kelly. R. Kelly's vocals are, are no joke. Yeah, I'm more of a I'm more of a Keith Sweat fan. Okay, but Keith Sweat can't touch R. Kelly. 
Mm, he got that tone, man. He got that sex tone, and yeah, you know, he's got a great tone. He's got great songs. You know, it's great too. Ba- Babyface is amazing. Yeah, I mean, Babyface's tone is is incredible. He got it. Um, Stevie Wonder. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. If we going back, back, way into time, right? But, but I mean, R. Kelly is still relatively. I mean, you know, he's not young, young, but he's still relatively, you know, in the conversation these days. You would put Bruno Mars over R. Kelly? I would put Bruno Mars over everybody. I'm telling you, I'm a singer, man. Over Michael Jackson? Over Michael Jackson? Wait, 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 wait. I would wait, put him over wait. Michael, and I love you Michael. You would put Bruno Mars over Michael Jackson? Over Prince? Over Prince. Over Prince and Michael Jackson. Yeah. Bruno Mars. He, yeah. He's going to watch this video, and he's going to get a high five from somebody. I'm, I'm, basing it, I'm not basing it off of swag or reputation or anything. I'm basing it off of actual... Um, Sonics. Okay. I mean, listen, uh, you're a singer, I'm not. So so, so we're so having a different sonically, conversation right now. Sonically, his range blows them away. Okay, let me ask you a question. How about, if you're talking about range, Bruno Mars versus Mariah Carey? Because she got range. Especially now he'll kick, it, kick her ass. Uh, back in the day, no. Back in the day. Uh, but best female singer of all time is Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston. So Whitney Houston versus Bruno Mars. Do, do not tell me Bruno Mars right now. Do not tell me Bruno Mars. Whitney, over, in, her, over Whitney, Whitney in her prime? Whitney in her prime. Whitney in her prime. National kick, anthem Whitney. Whitney in, in her prime could kick the shit out of anybody. Okay. Um, there you go. Um, also, yeah, Rodney also, Jerkins in our interview said that was the greatest female singer ever. Of period. course. He's 100%. Period. Right. And he's produced One of before. the best male singers that we have that a lot of people forget about is Michael Bolton. Yeah, I mean, he's dope. He just does uh, music that most people. Yeah, I mean, he just does phenomenal. music that a lot of young Especially, people don't like. It was hilarious when he did the national anthem and he read off of his hand. Did you ever see that video? <laughs> no, I did see that one, dude. You got to watch this video. Look at Michael Bolton national anthem. He's singing, "Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light, by the friendly we hand at the starlight last gleaming." <laughs> Who's Rod Shy? Stand back, and he like literally looks at his hand, bro. He, like the the ly- he had the lyrics written down. Like, how do you not know like the words to that? So but Michael good. Bolton. Hey, you're Chris, Michael Bolton. Uh, my, uh, Michael McDonald, one of my favorite singers. Uh, Kenny Loggins, one of my favorite singers. Jim Croach, one of my favorite singers. Um, those are the guys. Steve Perry, until he lost his voice, lost his, had his nodes issue. but And then it's crazy because you see Journey and they have the Asian dude or the Korean dude in the band now that yeah. emulates... Steve, Steve Perry, Perry, like yeah. almost to the T. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There but you, you can't, you can't beat Steve Perry in this cheetah, um, like sweatpants where you can see like both balls like hanging to like to the right, and then like the little the little peen like up 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 and to the left. Like they had man, how did they? Was that was that the trick back then to hit the high nose? Like put that shit up just, so just, tight, just and wedge, tight give yourself a, a mammoth toe and a fucking wedgie, bro. I don't know. I I, I, I don't know the tricks back then. So what's next for you? So uh, um, I have my single out right now, So Much To Say. It's off of my my label, Rackus Records, which I released the Love Project off of too, and then Sony ended up signing it. So uh, it's called So Much To Say. It's more of a just um, country hybrid ballad. And um, it was written about, you know, my stories and my family and things that I've been through and, uh, the whole album is being produced by Morgan Matthews, who is, uh, he just got nominated for a Grammy for Alicia Keys song that he did. And um, so he's producing the record. And then my buddy, he goes by the Winter Havens on Instagram. His name's Brian Cassidy. He's writing the lyrics and then I'm helping write and do production. We're all, it's a team. We're like three musketeers. So it's going to be like three, three different types of genre of musics in it. Good, nice ballads, but like, more leaning towards like the country kind of side because like you see me i'm tied it up i do my thing so when i when i go on a record like that and when i sing it it's different than if a country guy was to sing on it you know what i mean mm-hmm. so it gives that juxtaposition which, which i really love uh and then the up, up tempo records some good dance records and um just some really meaningful records that a lot of people are going to be to rate to relate to when it comes to their, to their families or problematic families because this album's called identity and it's all about my family it's all about the whole restraining order stuff my family what they've done everything you know it's it's all of that put in so because i'm so sick of talking about it and trying to get people to understand what's been happening to me 
And I think they're starting to open their eyes a little bit more and see where it's coming from. And um, I just think that the best way for me to respond to that is with music. I put it in my music. There you have it. Uh, Aaron Carter, man, I appreciate you coming back again. Um, you know, congratulations and really just kind of reinventing yourself and Thanks, man. adapting and, and trying different things. And you know what I'm saying? Kind of going against the norm and not I, really going what I the do. path. I go against the grain. I'd yeah. rather pet a shark this way exactly. than this way. Not not going the path of of some of your you know some of the people that you know in were, were in the business at the same time that you were correct. Uh, really standing out, being yourself, being unique, and not really caring what other people have to say. You know what I'm saying? Like you really got you really got to really do it. I mean, because yeah. otherwise you're gonna be so lost. And you know anybody else out there watching, you know that that does what I do. Do not become a prisoner to the perception of other people's opinion. Because if you do that, you will never figure out who you really are. You Sometimes you got to go against the grain. And and if you're going to release music, do it right, please. <laughs> do it the right way. Don't release shit. Release good shit. You know what I mean? If, it, if, it, if there's any inclination that it's shit, don't throw it away. You know what I mean? Or reinvent it somehow. Just like you can reinvent your career. I'm reinventing myself in a lot of ways. When first and foremost, you know, when it comes to my my health. Second, secondly, when it comes to my my music, you know, and my lifestyle. And I've been doing very well for the last four years. Great with real estate, you know. Um, great with all like four or five different endeavors of money of things that I'm doing. I haven't even touched the road in two years, and I've made more money without even touring in the last few years. Nice. So I've nice. been able I've been able to figure out how you know the world works how finances work and putting a good team around me having better people around me and really just um understanding the you know also the disease of addiction and what the triggers are and how to avoid those you know i don't club i don't drink i don't do nothing like that i dirt bike and stuff out in the desert you know so you're totally clean now oh i mean i don't even i cut back on even smoking weed okay like, what, what, what was and, the and I have a nicotine patch on now. Like, okay. Like, what was your main, like, the addiction that you struggled with the most? Because you, you've been to rehab. And- what I, every time I went to rehab, it was for huffing duster cans. Huffing duster cans? Like, computer duster cans. I would go to, like, 100 of those cans a day. Is that, like, nitrous? Kinda? It's worse. Way worse. Way worse. Worse than nitrous. And it destroyed my body. It destroyed certain chemicals in my brain, you know. Um, endorphins and why, serotonins. And why that as opposed to? I have no idea. Pills was, or cocaine I'm, or I have no heroin idea. Heroin or yeah, ecstasy I know. I know. I, I just the, because the usual, you know, oxy. <laughs> maybe, maybe I guess it was like it felt kind of childish to me because I was introduced to it by my sister when I was 17, 16. Okay, and it was kind of like a whip it, I guess. It's like yeah, like a whip it. Yeah, I remember. You know, out of, I've probably done one we, or two whip it. We start, in my day, first yeah. started out of our whipped cream cans. Yeah. Then we get in trouble with our moms because they knew what we did. But and then are you get high from whipped cream cans? Yeah, you can do it off. I of just did it just for the whipped cream. But. Yeah, no, you can do it off <laughs> whipped cream. It's it, you know, it's it's so terrible. And you know, I was, it took me four times over the course of eleven years to get it right. I mean, when you're standing, you know, when you go to this rehab facility and you guys are in a circle and you're talking about your issues and people are like, "Yeah, I was into the crack. I was into heroin. I was into the oxy." And you're it's like, not like that." In circles there. Well, I mean, but... People are too scared to kind of be, show the humility of what they've done. Okay. And I've noticed that when I go to group sessions, you know, when I, last time I was in rehab, Mm -hmm. that people were just kind of downplaying their addiction. And then I could see through it because the fourth time after 90 days, I was really locked and loaded and ready to be like, you know, I'm done. And then I see through some of the people that are like trying to downplay their addiction and then I'd literally get in fights with people and be like, excuse me, you know, like you're downplaying, you're downplaying right now your addiction and trying to mm-hmm. trying to uh, put validity behind the disease that you're going through. Yeah. And you're not really telling the truth. And I said, can you just please tell me the truth? And then someone would be like, oh, yeah, you know, all right, fine. Like, yeah, I, you know, I shot up heroin three grams a day or whatever it was, you know, and I'm just like. Okay, that's all you had to say because I'm sitting here telling y'all that I huff duster cans. I don't even know y'all from a can of paint. And I, when, every time I went to rehab, especially last time, there was five people kicked out because they were calling their friends, telling them what I was saying in my meetings. Mm. So then I couldn't even go to group sessions, and I only had to speak to my counselor, Chris. So, 
I was there for 90 days and this happened to me in like the first three weeks. And so I couldn't even have anonymity when in, in my sessions. So I had to have private sessions the whole time. So it was just like being a kid having a private tutor, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, I actually looked it up because I've never even really heard of this before. And they said canned air is essentially a toxic poison that is not meant to be inhaled, according to the safety information for dust off. Dusting or huffing these products can have negative immediate and long-term consequences. Inhale and abuse can cause permanent brain damage that can lead to irreversible neurological deficits. I take 900 milligrams of gabapentin a day. For the, it's a neuron. It's a neurontin, technically, is what it's called. So it helps the neurons in my brain. I take hydroxyzine. I take trazodone for sleep because I can't sleep because of this shit. Um, you know, I take Xanax also. I have to take that because this makes me a high risk seizure. So I take like the most dosage that you can actually get for Xanax. Like I take two yeah. a bar in the morning and a bar at night. Two milligrams in the morning, two milligrams at night. And I ha and and I also take propranolol, high blood pressure medication. And I, you know, and I also take 50 milligrams of Seroquel. And I have to take this regimen. This was regimented to me in rehab because I'll get twitches in my eyes and it can lead down to my face and I can get Bell's palsy. So well, because it seems and, like I, it's working. and I've destroyed my body for years, I'm still healing. Um, you know, I tend to get sick often from it. Um, there, it's it put metal metal particles in my body, all my organs, and inside my brain. Well, I mean, I can't and you say. You heard what I said. Long term. Yeah, effects. exactly. I mean, I can say though, you do look healthy. Thank you. You know, I mean, since our last interview, you look healthier. You look a little oh, little heavier. Thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you. You know, so whatever you're doing seems like it's working. Thanks. Man. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, no, I appreciate that. And now that. you have more of a reason to live. Yeah. Because now you have this little this little baby yeah, that cannot course. survive without you. Exactly. So, and, so and, there you go. That's an even bigger motivation correct. to do the right thing. Yeah. And it's my job to, you know, be the provider, make sure I'm on yeah. point, make sure that agents know what time it is, you know, booking agents, people, whatever, like that, uh, who I am, like, yes, I'm a household name, but I'm also just a person and I've been through a lot of struggles and I just deserve a second chance. You know yeah, what I mean? I, I just agree. everybody in this world deserves a second chance, really. Not unless you're like a mass murderer or something crazy. But like people deserve second chances. And I think that if if there is more of that in this world, that we would have a safer place. I agree. Aaron Carter, appreciate you coming back, man. Yo, All TV, the best. Until course, next bro. time. All right. Peace.